Thank you. Well, welcome everybody for coming tonight. I'm John Lockett, I'm the Dean of the Faculty. Just before I get to Mark, who has the floor for all of the night, we thought we'd try something different tonight to begin with drinks and food and give people <laughs> some And Sam said to me on the way in, John, I know you don't drink. <laughs> Would you just carry one in with you so that people feel comfortable? <laughs> take one in front of you? And I said, that's fine, I don't have any problem with that. And then as I walk all the way along here, nobody's holding a drink. <laughs> one, two. Oh, a couple of people. Thank you, mate. Feel a bit better. Um, Mark, welcome. It's so good to have an opportunity to invite all of you to have the chance to listen to Mark speak tonight. From a Monash Faculty of Education perspective, we're very proud to have the opportunity to have Mark join the faculty. He's been with us now for six months. Yeah. yeah. And he's starting to get the hang of the place. And that's a pretty good effort in six months, actually. <laughs> it's not all that easy. And so Mark came to us from the UK. The really good thing about Mark is that he's actually an Australian and he's found his way home. <laughs> <laughs> and in so doing, he's actually now starting to help us open our eyes to many of the things that are going on around about us. And it's really important as the Associate Dean Engagement that we do have fresh eyes looking at what we do and the way we do it, and to shake all of us, most of us, out of our comfort zone and away from the things that we so typically see around us. One of the things that Mark has done tonight then in changing the format of the Dean's Lecture Series what a challenge. Six months, he already comes in and says, we're doing it differently, John. <laughs> he says, I'll do a presentation, but then I want some people to respond to me. So I thought naturally he would ask the dean to be one of the responders, but no, he looks outside. How about that? A dean of engagement looking outside of the place. And so he's asked both Ruth and Esme to pay careful attention. There's the first strategy he's using to his presentation tonight and then they will respond appropriately to the ideas that he puts forward. So thank you very much both for participating in this in this way. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here. I really look forward to your um, lecture tonight, and I will hang on to that drink just for a little while. <laughs> thank you, so welcome. <laughs> Let me start with a few thank yous. Thank you to John and to the faculty for this opportunity. So early in my time here in the faculty. Um, it is actually an opportunity and a privilege, uh, and I'm grateful for it. Um, thank you to Bruce Armstrong and Esmond Cap, who are leaders in educational policy area and the educational practice area, for agreeing to uh, join me in this venture this evening. I'm really grateful. Um, and more importantly, most importantly, thank you to all of you I'm well aware there are many more exciting things to do on a Tuesday evening in this great city of Melbourne. Um, so the fact that you're here and that you've come in after the drinks were done before the talk um, is hugely appreciated. Um, it is. It, it, it really means a lot when people come to hear what you've got to say. Um, I want to use our time together this evening um, to look at the relationship between educational research and educational practice and education policy. Why have I chosen that topic? I've chosen that topic for two reasons. The first is that, can you hear me okay at the back, by the way? Yeah? yeah. Thanks, Gillian. Um, I've chosen that, th this topic for two reasons. The first is I realized that ever since the mid-1990s, I've been working on this issue of the use and usefulness of research in education in one way or another. It's been a recurring theme throughout my time. It was very, it, it was very clear early on uh, as a teacher turned PhD researcher looking at students' experiences of different kinds of environmental education within geography school classrooms. The relationship between research and practice was abundantly present in my work. It then was very relevant also during my time at the National Foundation for Educational Research, NFER, in the UK, which uh, is the UK's equivalent of ACER, where I was working on a whole load of evaluations of national policy curriculum initiatives, um, and also working smaller scale 
on practitioner inquiry and research engaged schools. So that it, was, it was present there. It was also present in the last eight years before I arrived in Melbourne. I was working independently as an educational researcher. And I was working on a number of projects around evidence-informed policy and practice for organizations like OECD, European Commission, and the Department for Education in the UK. Um, but I was also continuing that work around research-engaged schools. And just the fact that I was working independently, I was in that what's often called the no man's land or the, the border country between research and policy and practice. Um, so it's a great personal, this question of what's the use of research in education really means something to me personally. Um, you know, when I get that form that says occupation, I put down two words in different combinations, education and researcher. So it mean, it's important to me as to what, what the use is. A second reason it's important is that it's got huge political significance. You can't pick up a policy document in this state without seeing evidence and base and education and teaching in some way, shape or form. You can't look at the funding um, requirements for research councils without seeing requirements for the engagement of users, the involvement of the beneficiaries of research, thinking about research impact. Um, and you can't look at a university mission statement without seeing um, research impact, research utilization, knowledge mobilization, these sorts of terms keep cropping up. So I see this as important for me personally and also for our faculty politically and strategically. Um, in terms of how I'm going to approach the topic, it's going to be a talk with two halves, much like a northern hemisphere football match. Um, in the first half, I'm going to try and look at the use of research in education. What do we know? Really to look backwards and say, what, what can we draw from the literature about research use in education? And then in the second half, I'm going to try to look forwards and say, the use of research in education, what should we do? What are the, what are the, what are the opportunities and the challenges looking forwards? Okay? So, Turning to this first question, the re use of research in education, what do we know? This was exactly the question that I was posed with um, some almost 10 years ago when I was um, commissioned by a consortium of organizations who were looking to develop a portal, an online portal for practitioners and policy makers and the general public, in fact, to access evidence about education. This is what the portal looks like today, the Educational Evidence Portal in the UK. But before it was anywhere near, before it was just, before it was even in prototype, um, the development group of, of organizations who were interested in developing this um, wanted to know, what's the literature got to say that might help to inform such a portal? Because things like ERIC and other online databases, there was no research which underpinned those in terms of how do people want to use and access research evidence? So I was commissioned to um, look at the, the studies that had been done that might inform the ways in which the developers thought about putting this portal together. It was a sad experience. What became clear very quickly was that the use of our research had been a very clear blind spot for the research community. So these kinds of quotes came up again and again in the literature. A surprisingly small literature on the impact of research and policy and practice. Exactly the same when it came to think about what was the evidence base relating to how teachers make sense, make use, respond to research. Again and again, these quotes came up. And I've just taken two. They were literally. 10 plus, uh, this, point was being, this point was being made. Fortunately, if you notice the dates on the slides, these were from some time ago. There have been developments in the evidence base since then. And I just want to identify three before I move on to say, well, what, what has it shown? Initially, there was quite a lot of conceptual writing about the relationship between research and policy and research and practice. It wasn't matched by empirical studies. There was very little empirical work done prior to the mid 
or the early 2000s. Since that time, empirical studies have, have grown. And there's been a development from early on, there was work particularly around really thinking much more in a dissemination type mindset, saying, how do teachers or policy, mainly teachers, but sometimes policy makers and school leaders, how do they access research evidence? What's the accessibility? What's their awareness? What are their preferences for different kinds of research evidence? More recently, that's developed into studies that have looked more in depth at the actual engagement or the utilization of that evidence, rather than just looking almost survey-based uh, at what the, uh, the awareness and access is. And then another development which is clear is that most of the work has been by researchers, almost from institutions like this, looking out and saying, is our work doing anything? Is there any benefit to what we're doing? It's been very much research mindset looking outwards. More recently, you've started to get studies of different groups of users almost trying to look at use within in context. And actually, I kind of was thinking about this today, and we could actually add an extra development here, which would be studies of knowledge mobilization. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, I don't like the term, but there has been uh, an extra development there. And studies of research, studies of users, have, have developed into studies of brokers and brokerage. So it is a dynamic evidence base, um, and it's, it, you know, it, is, it is growing. So what can we draw from this? What, what, what's useful in this work that has been done over the last, over the last 10 years? I'm going to try to um, summarize it glibly in three words, um, but really it's not three words, it's three themes or three characteristics of research utilization I think we need to bear in mind in thinking about this topic. The first thing is it's abundantly clear that it's incredibly varied in the sense that we need lots of verbs in order to really get our heads around what it means to use research evidence. Simply talking about research utilization as if it's a singular process is unhelpful. Let me give you an example. I know that some people at the back are not going to be able to read this, but I'm going to talk it through anyway. Um, some years ago now, I did a piece of work with a small group of environmental education practitioners. <coughs> group of seven, seven practitioners uh, from across the UK. Um, we worked together over two years to explore connections between environmental education research and environmental education practice. Um, three of them were in the primary sector, two were in secondary, and two were in community-based outdoor learning uh, settings. They all responded to uh, a kind of shot-in-the-dark advert in an environmental education uh, newsletter saying, are you interested in exploring connections between research and practice? I had no idea how it was going to work out. I had some funding from my organization, NFER, the General Teaching Council, and BIRA, the British Educational Research Association. So you had a research funder, you had a professional learning of teachers funder, and you had a, a kind of contract research funder. Um, the reason I'm showing the slide is that what became very clear to us as a group after the two years we'd worked together when we wanted to share what we'd done was that we needed lots of verbs to specify and articulate what it is that, how, how the research had been useful to the different practitioners. And you can see them here. For some, it was very much about research helping to support or justify their practice. And those, even those two things are different. Support was much more about a personal aff affirmation of what I do. Support was um, more external and justification for, for what I do, often for the outdoor, the people in community uh, settings in terms of um, providing evidence for in funding applications, let's say. Um, in some cases, particularly the secondary context, the research was challenging practice, where it was highlighting um, difficulties, you know, there were the secondary school teachers were, 
were challenged by, you know, am I, am I teaching um, global environmental issues in a way that's helpful to students' learning? Um, some it was about reflecting. In, in some sense, in, for some people, using research was about doing research. It was about saying, well, I, I can see that that finding makes, you know, makes sense for the, for the sample that was used in the research study, but does it make sense for the year nine group that I'm teaching? Um, in other cases, it was about change, and for some, it was changing future current practice, and for others, future practice. The point is, this is a small group of, of teachers. I know that. Um, but it sh showed to me very clearly the variety of ways in which research can be used amongst a small group of teachers interested in a similar topic area. Um, and this has been flagged up by wider, wider studies. And one way to make sense of it conceptually is to draw on work that's been done, originated originally um, in the context of uh, practice-based nursing, um, where researchers in Canada at the University of Alberta drew what for me has been a really helpful distinction between instrumental use of research, conceptual use of research, and strategic use of research. The differences are in both what the research is providing to the user um, and the way in which it's used. So the, the stuff, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. The, the text in red are my words. Um, instrumental is, is, is about research providing answers. It's, it's about, um, a very, it's, it's almost an engineering based view of the utilization of research. Conceptual is much more about research changing mindsets. It's, a, it's research being one influence on policy and practice. And it's more about research raising questions. The third one um, is problematic for a lot of researchers, but it's researchers ammunition in strategic, so it's sometimes strategic or symbolic uses. The point of flagging, flagging these up is that often when people first approach the question of research use, practitioners and policymakers often come to the evidence base with instrumental expectations. And often the ways in which researchers share their research is with instrumental uses in mind. But people who work at the interface between research and policy and research and practice will tell you time and time again that it's here in the conceptual that most, most of the work, most of the connections are made here. And of course, in the strategic, particularly in policy circles. So it's worth reflecting, just thinking in your own work. Think about for the last fortnight, instances in which you have used evidence. What mindset have you brought to that? Has it been where you've been looking for answers? Have you been looking for questions? Or have you been looking for ammunition? When I've asked this of groups before, <coughs> clearly people work across. Um, but people are in the ammunition camp a lot more than they'd like to be. Particularly when you move into voluntary sector organizations and organizations that are, you know, well, actually in lots of different kinds of organizations. And researchers too. So it's, it's, it's really important to recognize, this whole point is about recognizing that research use involves many different kinds of processes. And so we have to be aware of that. That's one message which is coming very clear from the evidence base. Okay, a second one then, a second point, a second theme, a second characteristic of evidence use is this word. That the ways in which policymakers, practitioners, and other kinds of research users come to use evidence is in indirect ways. There's nothing direct about the use of research. Just take a look at these findings that have come from studies of 
school teachers, school leaders, and support staff in terms of the kinds of information sources whereby they access research evidence. What you see in this survey, and it's dated, I know it's dated, I've, I've, I've specifically put that there for a reason, um, is <coughs> INSET is, stands for in-service training, so in-service professional development. What you see time and time again, and in the next study, which is more focus group based with staff in research active schools and from more recently, is you get, it tends to be interactive situations where people are interacting with people as part of a training course, uh, an accredited course of some kind, or it's interacting with indirect. So it's not with research journals. We know this. It's not a surprise to us, but how often do we kind of have this at the front of our minds when we think about research use? How indirect it is and informal and interactive. These are the kinds of contexts in which policymakers and practitioners are coming into contact with research and research ideas. <clears throat> exactly the same if you look at evidence from policymakers, a much more recent study and much closer to home study. These aren't 384 policymakers anywhere, they're 384 of Bruce's colleagues in the department for uh, education and early childhood in Victoria. Um, and that's a piece of work that's been done by a research team at the University of Queensland who are looking at the utilization of social science research in policy. And they've done surveys of, I think, 13 different government departments across three states, one of which was DECD. So this is based on the DECD data. And I haven't put all of the, all of the um, responses there, but you can see again, it's indirect sources, internet, colleagues, people, interactions with people, involvement in forums, not the library. And I know this, none of this is surprising. I, I know it's not surprising, but it's amazing how we can recognize this isn't surprising, but we can also operate, actually, in our structures and a lot of our processes around research and research communication do not take sufficient note of these very fundamental findings from research about the use of research evidence. One way to make sense of this, more conceptually, I guess, um, and I'm not sure, can people see that? Yeah, you can see it there? OK, I know you probably can't read all of the. This comes from um, a researcher from the University of Toronto, Ben Levin, um, who put this forward actually quite some time ago, I mean, actually 10 years ago. Um, but it has been, it's, it's got more and more support. Um, it basically stresses that we need to recognize, if we're thinking about research utilization, we need to think about three things. We need to think about the context of research, research production. We need to think about the context of research utilization. But we also very fundamentally need to think about the context of, of knowledge mediation. And it's in this middle area, the mediation, where the huge mushrooming of organizations has been, particularly coming from the UK context. It's been huge. It's hard to keep up with the number of organizations which are springing up in that brokerage, mediation type, type space. I'm interested, actually, just to um, get a show of hands as to where people in this audience feel they sit or work more, more, more uh, accurately. So who, hands up, who would see themselves as working in a context of research production. Good. What about people who see themselves using in a context of research utilization, research use? <laughs> Libby, you can have more than one. <laughs> And lastly, people seeing themselves in a context of knowledge mediation. Far fewer hands. Yeah. All right. 
The, the point of doing that is to emphasize exactly Libby's point that you can have more, you can double dip on this particular <laughs> exercise. Um, and that's the point. We w this is not about where individuals are placed. It's about organizations and processes. And people move across the different things on this slide. Um, also, what has been shown in this audience tonight, there's quite a few knowledge producers. There's quite a few knowledge users. There are very few mediators. That's a concern. That is, that, and that's exactly the mindset that led Ben Levin to produce this slide. When I saw him deliver this many years ago at the European Commission, he had a simple slide up which had research on one side, practice on the other, and an arrow. And on the top of the slide, it just said, this is wrong. And then he gave this diagram. And on the top, it said, this is closer. But the, you know, we need the mediators and the brokers are absolutely where it's at in terms of research utilization. It is indirect, not direct. It's complex. It's not straightforward. It's mediated. It's not whatever the opposite of mediated is. Um, so that's another theme that comes from the literature very clearly that we need to recognize and think about. The last one, uh, the last theme I want to highlight from this is that research utilization is also incredibly contextualized. An incredibly useful, vol incredibly useful book on this um, is a book that was authored by um, Sandra Nutley, who is director of director of the of the research. Get this research utilization research unit. Roo roo. Um, <laughs> sounds sort of peripheral, doesn't it? But I tell you what, that organization and its outputs have been at the center of social science research developments, and uh, for the last 15 years, and they have led the way in terms of the ways in which the Economic and Social Research Council, the Cabinet Office, and a whole host of very important strategic organizations have thought about all of the issues that I'm talking about tonight. What they conclude is that, you know, based on not just looking in education, but other social sciences, that research use is a highly contingent process that shifts across settings and over time. We're educationists. We know about you know, all of this kind of shifting, complex stuff. But it, it is important to, to remember that it's very contextualized. Um, just briefly, um, the sorts of influences, I mean, there are a whole range, a whole plethora of enablers and barriers that can be influential upon uh, the use of research. And there's nothing. There is no meta-analysis being done on this that really shows uh, hard evidence of effect sizes of different kinds of factors. But what is clear from not meta-analyses, but systematic reviews of studies that have looked at research utilization in different contexts is that it's, and that's why it's in bold, is the nature of context is where you know, while we often think about research use in terms of individuals, it's the nature of the organizational context that can make or break the, how much evidence is used, when it's used, and if it's used. So we really have to bear in mind this question of organizational context. OK, those are my three key themes, if you like, coming out from the literature uh, on the use of research in, in education. These are the sorts of words that have cropped up. Contextual, dynamic, etc., etc. I guess I've come to think about a way to summarize this is that research use is not about the transfer or the transmission of information. Research use is about professional learning. All of these words are learning type words. It's actually a pedagogical challenge, research use. And I'm reminded of some very uh, influential um, commissioned work that was done by a team led, uh, headed up by Michael Fielding at the University of Sussex in the UK. It was actually a team from the University of Sussex with some researchers from the think tank Demos. 
And they were commissioned by the Department for Education at the time to um, look into what factors influence the transfer of, good pra of best practice between schools. You can imagine the scenario. You've got leading edge or beacon schools, and it's like, how does, how does uh, schools which are successful help schools which are less successful? What they did was go back to the, to the Department for Education and say, we can do that, but what's really important is that transfer is the wrong analogy. It's not about the transfer of good practice. It's about the joint development of practice. And there's a whole, there's a whole kind of literature now about JPD, joint practice development, which has emerged. But it's an important idea because they'd say, you know, that, that, that you know, improvement between schools is not about the transfer. It's not about transfer issues. It's about relationships and, and learning and joint practice development. It's exactly the same with research utilization. At this stage, I just want to pause for five minutes, give you an opportunity to absorb what's been said so far, and to talk to the person sitting next to you or behind you um, about what does this mean for your work in whatever, whether you're a mediator, uh, a, a consumer of research, a producer of research, what might this mean, the fact that research use is contextual, it's indirect, um, and it is varied? What might that mean for you in your role? Um, and then, five minutes, and then I'll tell you what I think, and Bruce and Esme will tell me, tell you not to listen to that and think about what they, they're going to say. Okay, five minutes, people. Good to hear some conversations going. Um, look, in terms of my sense of what, I don't often use the word should, but I guess I just thought I would try it tonight and say, what, what, what should we do? I think we need to face up to four challenges. I'm going to talk through each of these, but just briefly, there's something to do with engagement, there's something to do with knowledge mobilization, there's a clear need for capacity building, and this is an area that needs research. In terms of engagement then, an issue close to my heart, <coughs> personally and professionally. Um, I had the great pleasure of working for a number of years on a project with Anne Edwards, uh, who's based at the Education Department at Oxford University. Um, I mean, before that was at other places, but... And she's just one of those... She's a real intellectual leader, and she wears it lightly. Um, and in her BIRA, British Education Research Association, um, the year that she was BIRA president and gave a lecture, she talked about this idea of education being an engaged social science. And she drew a contrast with her previous experience as being a historical researcher and briefly being a social psychologist. And it's really stuck with me, as well as the experience of working with Anne over a number of years. And she would talk about the way in which there are different practices in education, and research is one practice. And we have to think really carefully and sophisticatedly about how we weave together the knowledge of different kinds of practice. And I don't mean, I mean practice in a sort of, you know, in a, in a sociocultural, in a rich way, a social practice way. Um, so policy is a pra you know, practice, so, so is practicing, practice practice and research practice. Um, another way of, of thinking about this is, all right, I'm getting a signal I need to speak up because the rain, okay. Usually this is where something dramatic happens in the film. It's raining. Um, okay. Um, it, 
You know the book, I'm not sure, I'm not sure many of you will have heard of the book, The New Production of Knowledge, which was published actually 20, yeah, 20 years ago, 1994. So it's not new, in fact. Um, but Michael Gibbons, who was the first author of that, later, five years later, published a short article in Nature in which he kind of set out the key arguments. And one of the things, the past, a, a quote from that has always stuck with me, which is, the more open and comprehensive the scientific community, the more socially robust will be the knowledge it produces. And the image that I suppose my inspiration for thinking about engagement is that we really have to think about the, the robustness of our research, uh, our, uh, our research outputs, our research process, uh, processes, um, and the, the, ways, the, the ways in which we work as researchers. Uh, I think of this, this is like the internal strength of something. It's a, it sounds a bit naff this, but um, you know the difference between Pilates and gym. You can kind of go to the gym and, and look very buff, you know, and kind of strong, but actually underneath... It's not working for me. You're not. <laughs> it, you're not. It's that Pilates that works on the really small connections between the big muscles and the skeleton. And I think that's what engagement is about in terms of research knowledge. It's not the kind of flash, big picture robustness. It's the strength of it internally, of, of, of the knowledge and the processes. Um, I think we, we really need to think about how, how engaged our research is, what's the... Ah, I know I'm not being crystal clear here, um, but there's, there's something about um, the role that engagement can play in terms of pulling together different types of knowledge that will create evidence and research uh, outputs and ideas which are much more socially robust as well as academically valid. And if the science community were talking about that 20 years ago, we sh definitely need to be talking about it now and thinking about it. Okay, my second uh, challenge is the mobilization challenge. I don't find this a helpful term at all. It's come mainly from Canadian researchers. Um, and this is a very Canadian quote um, for what knowledge mobilization means. And I'm going to have to read it because I can't remember it. Um, moving knowledge into active service for the broadest possible common good. Now, if I had to guess as to the source of that quote, it would either be someone in Canada or someone in Sweden. I'm, but it's actually someone in Canada. Um, but this idea of thinking about the structure and the infrastructure um, and the movement of knowledge within, within our sector is really important. We're not good at it. We're really, really not good at it. When you look at comparative studies of social care, of criminal law, of um, community health, of different criminal just different, organ different sectors of public policy, education has a very weak infrastructure for making Ev making research evidence accessible and usable um, for non-researchers. So it's a relatively new area, and universities, which are a source of a lot, still a lot of a, a source of a lot of research knowledge, do not play their part well in this. And I'm sure that Monash is no exception to that to that uh, to that fact. So we need to think differently. That doesn't mean we need to become a completely different kind of organization, but we do need to think about what sorts of organizations can we learn for, learn from. Um, I had a short experience of working at a think tank in the East End of London called the Young Foundation. I only worked there briefly, but I learned a lot, and I keep thinking about it. Um, it's an easy thing to say, we ought to learn about research communication from think tanks. And if I were talking to an audience of researchers, most would say, yeah, right. They're good at communication, but they're hopeless at research. That's why they're good at communication. 
but we can learn from the ways that they think about the communication and the, uh, of, uh, and the mobilization of, of their knowledge. I saw that at the, at, at, the, uh, at the Young Foundation very clearly. They would think incredibly carefully and strategically about how they put together an advisory board for their research projects. Really, they would spend a long time and put a huge amount of effort and resource into that because they knew that that made a huge difference to later visibility for the work. But the Young Foundation is distinctive. It's not your usual left of centre think tank. It, you know, it's got a tradition of Michael Young, sociology. There's a, there's a whole history there that means they think very carefully, not just about how you communicate knowledge, but how you can build it in terms of institution, new kinds of institutions, social innovation. And I really think there's a lot that we can learn, and they do a lot of work in the area of education, and universities can, can learn, or at least work with, but learn from the ways in which interesting kinds of think tanks and social innovation organizations work and operate in this area. Okay, so there's a mobilization challenge. There's also very much a capacity building challenge. This is a quote from the UQ, the University of Queensland research group, who did a survey of educational academics' perceptions of the use of, of research. Um, and one of their conclusions was that developing the necessary know-how of research communication, research collaboration, is not part of mainstream academic training. This was exactly what myself and Anne Edwards and Judy Seba, another researcher in the UK who spent a considerable amount of time in government, we, had, we, we were part of, um, well, we ran a, an ESRC-funded thematic seminar series around the issues of involving research users in and with research. And what was very clear from the, the projects that came to speak as part of the seminar series was that researchers were strong in terms of the things on the left-hand side of this slide, in terms of knowledge generation but struggled, a lot struggled, with the things on the right-hand side of this slide, which are about knowledge mediation, <coughs> much more about relational expertise. And Anne Edwards has done a lot of work in this area in terms of looking at the, the ways in which different kinds of groups, professional groups within education, work together. So that how can we... It's, it's not saying that we have to be become something different as educational, academic educational researchers, but we need to recognize that we need, yes, we need know-how and know-what skills, but we also need know-who and know-when. We need the relational as well. We need to be able to, you know, remember, research use is indirect. It's varied. It's contextualized. We can't simply say we're going to be really great academic researchers. It's not enough. We need to do more than that and think about how does this play out in terms of academic strengthening? How does this play out in terms of our research training? We do need to be thinking on both sides of this, of this slide. Lastly, there is a research challenge. I started off right at the beginning of this talk by saying that there hadn't been, it was a blind spot, the use of research, which is ironic. You know, in a, we're an applied we're an applied field. We're an engaged social science. And we weren't thinking about application. We weren't thinking about engagement. We weren't thinking about impact in terms of our empirical research agendas. We have to continue to grow that slide that I showed earlier about the evidence base. It needs, in five years' time, it needs to have much more hexagons on there and more, more, uh, more diversity of research studies. Um, <laughs> My picture here, and this is my final slide, um, is really, I suppose, I've chosen this because this is a little bit of an over-exaggeration for the state of the evidence base on research utilization, but it's not too far off. It's still something that has potential but needs to be grown. Also, this picture depicts me and my ideas coming to Australia. Um, 
I'm here to try and grow something. Uh, this is important, this area of the use of research. To me, uh, and I think it's important <coughs> strategically, and I think it's an opportunity for this faculty and for this state in terms of its education. I know that there are all too many people who've arrived on these shores with an accent like mine, um, seeds in their pocket and ideas in their heads that weren't necessarily useful or wise. Um, and this, I suppose, is a first step by saying, I think there's a useful agenda of research to be developed here. I'm keen to do that, but with your help. Um, and this talk has been an opportunity uh, to share that as a first step um, and to open it up in a moment to, to Bruce and Esme to try and move it from being something small to, to slightly bigger uh, and, and more strategic. So thank you for your time and for your attention. And Bruce, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to invite you to uh, respond in whatever way you, you, you see fit. Um, Bruce Armstrong is Chief Executive of the Basto Institute for Educational Leadership um, and the Acting Executive Director for the Division of School Leadership, Performance and Policy. Huge portfolio um, within the department, uh, within DECD. So Bruce, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you. just get myself wired up here. I think that they're wanting to record it. So um, being a senior bureaucrat and having a recording is always, um, I'm not sure that it allows for truth telling. Um, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, thank you, Mark, for the opportunity and for the invitation. John, also, thank you for your support. It's been great to get to know Mark a little bit as uh, he's been uh, part of a very important team putting the principal preparation program together with Monash in partnership with Basto and uh, founding it on evidence and research. Uh, I like your last slide, uh, Mark. It's a bit of a worry. I hope that uh, you know uh, plants from outside Australia are not called indigenous. They're exotic. And uh, we just hope that it doesn't get hit by some roundup. So, um, but the, I, I, there are lots of things that I found uh, quite uh, compelling in your, your talk. And uh, I'm going to go back to a couple of slides, if I may, if I can find my way back through a few, right near the beginning, if I may. Um, and then click forward to a couple. That's the one I was after. The interesting question in my mind is, who are the mediators in this equation? And the interesting thing is that uh, Levin proposed that the mediators should be an agent beyond the people that is both the site of practice and the... You're going to help. I'm going to help. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need help.
to occur by others and give others our agency, then we have uh, a diminution of our own professional standing. And I think that that's part of the challenge of teachers is not being a profession with a practice. That we don't own the nature of our knowledge base and we're not growing it, the evidence base, together. And that's different in law, it's different in engineering, it's different in architecture. And as a consequence, those particular fields and domains of professional practice are not done to in the same way as perhaps educators feel that they are. So I think that the notion of engagement is engagement strategically in the formation of the research that is grounded in practice with practitioners and respecting their voice, taking them into a community of inquiry about their own work. And that would be true in pre-service education as well, because one of the best gifts that we can give is people not only an understanding in a vocabulary around research, but how they can have a disposition towards being curious about the impact of their progress throughout their professional career. So that was one of my questions in relation to that, in terms of the social construction of knowledge. And if you look at this kind of maths professional mediation, is that one of the things that we know about education at the moment in terms of you don't need mediation through centres of knowledge anymore, places called, places called school and universities, because knowledge is increasingly unbounded. But there are other people who are in there promoted to the round profit and the vertical integration of systems where they harvest that content and repackage it back, which really is uh, anathema to research. And then the other one that I wanted to tackle oh, was this one, because I thought it was really helpful that you talked about research and its engagement as not about transfer, but about learning. And I think that that's fundamentally true when you look at those words and you look at uh, the, the site of the use of research. One of the things that I found quite um, interesting in my own reflection of my professional career, both as a teacher and then a principal class member for 12 and a half years, and in 1997 when I sat around the table with a group of teachers who were leaders in the school, and started putting research on the table to have a conversation, probably because I wanted to provide answers rather than ask questions, so it was probably quite instrumental. Um, and it, sometimes I wanted to use it as a weapon and a fairly blunt one <laughs> at times um, to try and say we need to shift our practice here, you know, what, what are we standing on? Uh, and probably wasn't as open to inquiry initially. I think I learned through those engagements. But nonetheless, the thing that I found really quite remarkable was the degree of antipathy and weariness of research informing teaching practice. People were really quite, you know, what will I do on Monday was the kind of imperative, what am I going to teach, rather than how am I teaching, what's informing my um, curriculum framing, what's informing my pedagogical stance, and so on. So I found that really helpful because I think it's about how do you help people learn in the sites of their practice and their sites of research. <coughs> And I'll come to my role as in policy formation in a moment, but that I found particularly helpful. Then we go on to the slide just before this particular one. I think that uh, when you look at the issue, and got a, a senior policy officer here, uh, Lynn Swain, it's great to have her here, um, and I've learned a lot from her uh, around the importance of evidence and research uh, in policy formation. It's a particularly difficult task, and it's difficult because the bureaucracy's role is to provide and serve an agenda of a democratic, democratically elected government. And they come with all sorts of positions that are taken in election time that may not necessarily be informed by things that we would call an evidence base or research. Uh, and that's across the political spectrum. Often learned from policy borrowing rather than policy learning from other jurisdictions that they might see wholesome promise of shifting the system forward. And so there's a mediation between the bureaucracy and the political layer as well internally. So what struck me in reflecting on uh, the way that you're talking is that there is a challenge to build capacity or communities of practice within the policy arena, within bureaucracies. Uh, and it's often in particular parts of the department where they have a role around research and development, but more broadly how if it's only a dissemination or a transfer um, within the department, it's not likely to occur any more than this, you know, to try and diffuse or transfer practice between Beacon schools or navigator schools, lighthouse schools, and schools down the road, because it is around joint development uh, together and learning it's a pedagogical or a learning stance. I suppose um, item number three there around building capacity is that 
it's building capacity, I think, particularly of principal leaders, to understand that one of the key roles that they have is to create a genuine learning community where people are reflecting on their practice and drawing on their <coughs> asking questions about it and creating a community of inquiry. And that is a very sophisticated task. Um, and you will find, uh, you will find as you work with 40 people this year, that they will find that quite challenging with the task of setting the principal preparation program. As for principals, we'll go back into contexts and environments that won't necessarily host the imperatives of the course that they're in. So for me, part of the reason I came into the work and part of the aspiration I have for my work, uh, both as a policy maker and in terms of professional learning services, is to use research to open up questions and to help people to explore, which is that kind of conceptual framing. And I know that I could, within, often within the department, we're not necessarily using it, using it more probably as a strategic lever in some ways, to try and make a point. <laughs> And uh, that can be unhelpful because you're not really allowing people to open up and to learn with them because you're trying to drive a particular agenda or point. Um, and knowing that um, sometimes um, policy is informed and developed by evidence, but it's not necessarily, sometimes it's also um, policy in search of evidence. <laughs> so, um, and that can be an uncomfortable place to be in sometimes. So, um, I found it really quite provocative. And I hope that uh, it's a plant that gets nurtured and grows as well. So thank you. Thank you. Captain's principal of Princess Hill Primary School in North Carlton. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I've just <coughs> resigned from my principal position. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, she was enjoying it that much. <laughs> <laughs> taking the process of 5411. So, about to become an applicant um, for the position again in the next couple of weeks. Um, I've also just um, completed my PhD. Um, so, I've lived over the last eight years. Um, between the worlds of um, being a principal um, and being a researcher um, at Monash University. Um, so it was really um, important, um, that first point, um, in terms of the use of research um, in education. And if I come back um, to eight years ago when I was at one of my first, and I have some of my colleagues here from my um, PhD group, um, at my first meeting at university, where we were discussing research, discussing each of the people's PhD, what they were doing, what the university was doing in research. And I left that meeting um, and then went to a principal's meeting um, and actually had that feeling in that principal's meeting that I was now about to live in two totally different worlds <laughs> um, that just didn't relate and didn't correlate. Um, and that really grew um, over the years. Um, and the real key element, which you've marked, um, touched on, Mark, was that indirect that continually, you know, I'm being told at university for it to be evidence-based, you were being continually questioned, um, evidence was being scrutinised, you were looking for multiple perspectives on a current um, topic or idea, whereas you'd go to a principal's meeting um, and continually there will be one point of view put forward, and particularly over the last few years it's been happy. And what I would continually do is, is to see the misinterpretations in people's presentations on happy. Um, and continually the misinterpretations of Vygotsky's work of the zone of proximal development. Um, and so this misinterpretation and this secondhand um, ideas um, is continually um, creating miscommunications um, within the, in the work that we try to do. Um, so I think it's very important from a principal's perspective to understand the multiple contexts um, also that you raise, that it's very contextual that a principal lives in, that you live in um, head office briefings, saying what's a new policy, what's being implemented, what do you need, what's your accountability within a school. You then go along to a, a regional um, principal network meeting where you're working with colleagues and you're expected to collaborate. And one of my colleagues 
um, is in the room also. They're expected to collaborate um, with those and to dialogue and to question practice um, within different contexts. You then go into your school community where you're trying to lead a parent community and to create change within um, that context. You then go into your staff room um, and you're working with teachers trying to create change within that context. So the context that a principal works in um, are really immense. Um, what's been really important um, for me in, in what should we do is to create that community of learners um, within the school, community of researchers um, and to really question practice. I came into a school in which experts had been working with the school and it was very much the teacher's role to implement the programs that these experts were giving them. They didn't question, often they'd come along to the meetings, they'd listen to it all and they'd go in and shut their door and go and do it their way. Um, they wouldn't um, critique, um, question, challenge what was happening. Um, within my own research, um, one person that very much influenced me was someone called Seth Chaikman. Um, and he developed what he calls practice developing research. That research has to take place in practice in the complexity of all of these elements. Um, and that was that slide you talked about with, with all of the lines and all of the connections. Because every decision you make has so many multiple ramifications to so many different aspects of the work um, in which you're doing. And so within our community of practice, um, my research was actually on collective inquiry and how to bring about transformation of learning through collective inquiry within schools. Um, and so research comes right down to the practice of children in their education. So it's children learning through inquiry, learning research, but you also have teachers as researchers. So within the context of planning an inquiry project, it's an expectation that teachers have a research question, that the team of teachers are researching um, alongside with the children some aspect of their practice. Um, you have the staff working on research to improve practice and often that involves bringing in people from university, being connected to projects. Um, our school is currently working um, with a deep project of, of Michael Fullen um, looking at technology and the use of technology. So often involved in projects um, with universities linking in with that. So that connection again and that engagement in that process um, is really crucial. Another really challenging one, um, Princess Hill Primary School being in a very high socioeconomic um, area, is the engagement of parents in research. Um, because one of the greatest challenges for change in education is changing parents' perception of what education should be. So that's another area that really needs to be tapped into in this area of engagement um, into research. And that's come about um, within my school in terms of getting teachers involved in research projects as well. And again, tapping into experts, getting researchers working alongside teams of parents. And so two aspects the school is currently working on is communication strategy of how do we communicate the different practices um, within our community and beyond our community to other educators um, and the use of technology to support the new pedagogy that we're doing. So that engagement um, of all members um, in the processes is really crucial. Um, the second point of, of mobilisation um, is about changing the role of what a teacher is. Um, you know, a teacher has to be a questioner. They have to be a researcher. Um, uh, and, and your teachers, as many of you I'm sure are researchers, becoming a researcher is not a simple process. Um, it's not something that happens, um, here's a few lectures, here's a few techniques. Um, it took us a whole year um, to just change the consciousness of we're not going to take a program and bring it into the school. We're actually going to question, we're going to analyse, we're going to justify. Um, and one of the biggest things that staff do between each other is to question why. So why are you doing it that way? Why has that topic been chosen? Why are the groupings of your children in this num um, number of children? And so all team level um, meetings have a total focus on that process of, of critiquing each other. And that's another thing that teachers find very hard to do, 
is to provide constructive feedback um, to each other. They're just focus is really on being supportive. So that changing the role of teachers to become researchers um, is a huge issue and a huge challenge um, to be faced. And capacity building to do that has been for us um, working with Professor Marilyn Fleer um, from Monash University who has come out um, and worked extensively with a group of teachers within our school who would volunteer to become part of a research project um, but for now, for two years, we've had 20 staff members of, it, of an evening, meeting, looking at research. Um, at the moment, our research focuses on potentive um, assessment um, and what does potentive assessment look like, how do we know children are within, we're in the zone of potential development. Um, and so there's a high level readings, the whole technique of research um, with Monash University and, and DEET approval. And that's the way that I've tried to engage teachers really in um, deep level research. And obviously that's now moving on to teachers moving into masters um, and other further qualifications. So that capacity building um, is also incredibly um, important. And the last one, the research challenge um, of how to bridge the gap um, between policy, I think between universities, um, and between teacher practices is a huge challenge. Um, but it's really crucial um, for us to create the change that needs to happen um, within schools. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we have a couple of minutes. I think maybe we'll give an opportunity for a few questions of either Bruce, Esme, or uh, Mark. Problem about that, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. I'll just while the microphone's swapping over, Bruce and Esme, I assure you that there'll be lots of beeping out in the video, so <laughs> none of these things go back in, a, in an inappropriate way. But how good is it to have the real world of policy and practice reflecting on the um, other world <laughs> of research? And it does make a difference. And Mark, you know, the diagram you had there, the idea of research production, research users, and then mediators, just reminds me of what a world we live in. I wrote a book a little while ago that I thought wasn't too bad. And my wife's a primary teacher. And at her school, the principal came up and said, your name's Lochran. You wouldn't know John Lochran, would you? <laughs> and my wife said, oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I could track him down. <laughs> and the principal said, you know, he did this book. Do you reckon there'd be any chance of getting him to come to the school and do a presentation? And my wife, I'm trying not to use names here to give away anything, said, oh, I, I could get in touch and find out what's possible. And she said, is it any good? And my wife said, who knows, I don't read his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, you had a chance to have a think. Any questions? of the, the panel, as it were. Please don't be shy. Bring your chairs out. Yes, please, go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Louise Watson, and I'm, I really enjoyed the talk and the responses. Particularly this focus on mediation and Bruce's challenge to not give mediation away. I think it's a very pressing challenge for academics. Uh, we're in the context of era now, where there's a lot of pressure to be cloistered again. And from my perspective, education practices have always been quite good at um, working with schools and with practitioners. Um, but that sort of work, the sort of tiny connections that you were talking about, Mark, it's not necessarily valued in, in era counts. Mm -hmm. It's it's a start international journals. Mm -hmm. It's it's very hard to bridge those two schools of thought. And yet we see all the time here that the think tanks, like in the US, are taking over the harvest in a in a very agenda driven way. And so I just like um, Mark's and the panel's views on 
whether universities should be doing more to um, become mediators and how we do um, bridge that communicate good communicators, not necessarily good researchers. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, Louise, uh, you know, there almost wasn't a question mark at the end of your, of your question. You know, I, I think I know where you're coming from, and, and, and I, I feel the same. I think we can't give up. That's a, I mean, Bruce's comments was actually very helpful. I mean, we, we can't give up that mediation role. We have to take it on. We have to see that as part of being, you know, uh, a good educational researcher and a, and, a, and, a, and a good educational research faculty. Um, it is. Um, I don't know. I mean, accountability structures, we, we just can't be um, bound by them. We, we, you know, we don't expect, we look at schools and we want school principals to have a strong sense of what quality learning and teaching is about. We, we don't expect them to be you know, to be hugely driven by policy directives. And we have to have the same, we have to find ways to have the same approach. Um, I just think it's about thinking of clever ways to develop research agendas um, which have academic credibility but also social robustness. And, and, you know, we have to find ways, we have to talk and work together to find ways to, to do that within education companies. <laughs> Uh, just for, I want to recommend if you want to see a wonderful school, go and uh, visit uh, SNA School. It really um, it, it comes to life when you're there, and it's not just rhetoric. So it's, uh, having visited there only very briefly, uh, I'd love to go back again. Uh, the sight of what happens when people get to learn together, guided by uh, people who are informed academically. Um, I think that it's a number of the things that Mark was talking about is that if knowledge is mediated, socially constructed and built through relationships which forms the foundation for engagement, the questions to education faculties that want to influence about what we know about the usefulness of research in its you know, indirect and direct forms. My question would be, how does the Faculty of Education um, engage with uh, senior policy makers in the Department of Education in its two treasury? Is there an engagement strategy? Is it only by invitation, built through relationships? What's the nature of that engagement? Is there a site of learning in a principal network within the stone throw of the University Faculty of Education where there are 20 plus principals who could be influenced to create a community of practice that influences the nature and use of research as a test bed of research itself around researching into engagement? Some of these things are perfectly within the scope. Now, people are time poor and have accountabilities within each of the systems in which they work. And we all work in multiple layers of accountability and complexity. But it seems to me that it is about field trialling some of these things. And thinking, as Mark said previously, about the mobilisation of knowledge at the point of engaging in the research framing itself. So if you're thinking about for what and for whom, um, right at the beginning mm. point. Mm. Uh, and I think that that gives us a different frame of reference. And then I think we have to work in the longer term through pre-service to think pre-service, induction, in-service. And for people to have a different understanding of what it means to work through that, to have a conceptualisation and frames of reference that allow them to research and do the practice so that they will go directly to the academic journal. But you would find, I think, a very small percentage of teachers who would take the time to be, and to do that as they move through their career. So they're overwhelmed by the exigencies and the contemporaneous nature of inducting themselves into the profession and then have lost sight of the locus that they're learning back in the university and don't re-engage. And so in-service education is really often programmatic and poorly conceived. And we need to reconceptualize in-service education. But that's another site of influence, I think, for universities, where they really can genuinely influence the nature of what was inset or CPD or on-site professional learning where there's a completely different frame in SNA school compared to what I would suggest is a lot of other schools. Um, and people being quite fearful of research because people often feel that it's a critique of their current practice. Mm -hmm. And if people come to it as deficit, well then mm -hmm. uh, it's a frame that they feel that you're not doing the right thing. And I don't know, in my early stages I would have been using it, you know, as blunt instrument or um, but 
learned it myself though, as you open up and put it on the table, the centre of the table, and say, let's investigate this together and get a different conversation. Mm -hmm. I think you know, my work in everything that I do comes down to a moral you know, obligation. You know, that I'm an educator and I need to create the best learning um, for the children in my care. Um, and I think that just has to come down to you know, what is the research you know, that's to impact yeah. society um, and it's to have an impact of, of all your work um, to create a better world. Um, and so it has yeah. to become involved in yeah. some way. It has to have a purpose. Piece of paper. I have a PhD, which is the end of my table. There's no point in that PhD sitting on my desk at home if, if what all those eight years of, of work isn't impacting um, our parents' work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super. Loudly, please. Okay, I'll try and shout. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Super from the Faculty of Education. Um, I, I find this a fascinating conversation about sort of mediation and the the issue about who, who are those mediators and how one becomes a mediator. And I certainly welcome the kind of comments about seeing this mediation space as a place where people from a variety of different places can, can engage, um, given the tendency in, for education research often to get taken up in privatized ways and repackaged and resold back to us in, in other kinds of ways. But I just wonder, um, really just opposing a, a kind of thought, I've not heard people talk about the role of learning societies. And um, academic learning societies, in my experience, mm. both in the UK and mm. in the, the part of education I'm involved in, which is um, more the um, post-compulsory area, that learning society practices seem to be a very engaged space where when I've been to events, there are both researchers and active policy makers and practitioners. Uh, and they seem to me a, a space where you can start to work on mindsets. You can have different opinions, but you can also start to work, work together with mindsets. So it's just a question really about what you see as the role of learning societies in this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, like you, Sue, I think they're a really important uh, space and they can be quite um, constructive in the sorts of issues that we've raised this evening. Um, and I, I'd say the same for professional associations, subject associations amongst uh, the teaching community. They, you know, and, I, and I'm guessing also school principal networks. And, and, you know, you can kind of take that idea of learning societies and broaden it to a sort of a category of uh, professional associations which are, you know, come up time and time again, particularly in studies of the look within of practitioners' use of research within particular subjects like science or languages or, you know, geography, etc. Um, do you guys want to add anything? You know, I think that, that the concept of multidisciplines is, is really important. We have a, a network of people within our school who we lay, so Professor Alan Pierce is one of them, Bruce Dixon is another one who is a mediator out there in the world trying to create mm. change, um, and Mary Featherston is another one, an interior designer. And, and we continually have, and, and, and parents from our school council are involved, we continue to have think tanks, um, but you have to have the multiple different perspectives mm. um, there at the table bringing in all of the others. Mm. One more? Research here. There's a thing called wait time. Better wait time. <laughs> <laughs> Keep holding. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm David Isaacson from Monash College. Thanks, David. See, wait time. <laughs> always works. Always always works. works. Yeah, it's, a, it's a quick one. You know, that's last. Um, just this whole idea of, of formalizing that mediation space. Is is there any research into that? Obviously, the research is going to get harvested if it's not formalized and placed in some kind of context and recognized as a mediator space. Is there any possibility of, of creating a standard and a, and a process that becomes a kind of benchmark um, where people would recognize 
something <coughs> harvested and sold back versus something that comes out of, out of a real community of inquiry that, impli that, that applies in a context and can be of value. Yeah, gee. I think this really speaks to the capacity building issues and the, the, the you know the, the complexity that, that Esme was raising about you know you don't you don't become a researcher overnight mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the subtleties of the judgments about you know what types of evidence to use how to place the emphasis um, how to synthesize and, and galvanize evidence in different ways they are. It's skilled, it's skilled work, that. And um, the trouble is, there are, you know, there are hierarchies of evidence and all those sorts of things, which are, you know, hopelessly unhelpful. Um, you know, incredibly appealing to to senior decision makers, um, incredibly frightening to a lot of researchers, and um, you know. I don't have a quick, easy answer. It's a quick question, but there's no <laughs> quick answer. <laughs> what, what you... uh, it's a rhetorical answer. One of the things that I suppose I would, why I went to that slide is that um, it's a space that we should not yield and not play in. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about the space that we should not yield and not play in. So yes, you're going to have all of these other, it is a messy space of public discourse, but we need to be in the public domain. And so sometimes when I see the kind of discourses that occur, I'm yearning the academic researcher to come out and actually put um, a point of view, uh, maybe a counterpoint, um, to some of the discourses around um, that occur around the trajectory of Australia's educational system and what's it underpinned, you know, um, our position on leave tables, how do we tackle the issues of inclusion and equity in our society and so on. So you don't, I, I think that sometimes it, we become bounded by whatever organisation you're working. So that if you're thinking strategically around engagement, you can think that when those opportunities arise, who will be the spokesperson? What will be the form? You know, um, because there are lots of online forums, there are ways in which you can have public statements and media releases and so on, and there's not a lot that actually plays out, I think, from the academy in that in that space. And that's why I think it's not a place that we should necessarily retreat from because it's conflict. Mm. Yeah, I think it's in Paris that that conflict happens. But as you say, it's, 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 you know, it's a hierarchy, isn't it? And to me, it's also the hierarchy within academia. Mm. It's, it's the amount of debate that happens between academics um, is huge. And often, you know, mm. people like this go, oh, you're an academic. Mm. Um, but the diversity within that is that I'm going to respect if you could actually have come to the mm. table. I'll just wrap it up. Why we've had some, an opportunity, please, to pursue these people outside over the drink and a nibble. Let me just do two very quick advertisements. In this, our 50th year, Faculty of Education, there are a number of things that are happening. We're having our, our history is being written, and the book is now with the publisher <coughs> being put together. Um, Alan Gregory has done that for us, and that will be available during the year. On the 30th, Thursday, the 30th of October, we will be having a party at the National Gallery of Victoria. Check our website, get a table, come along and have fun. And on the 31st of October, at the Hyatt on the Park, over the road from Treasury Place, Bruce, you can push this one back at the DCD. We're having an open forum for the day on education and pushing the notions of social justice, opportunity, and development of possibilities for people's growth and development. So, for us, in one sense, in the notion of mediation, it is a difficult space, but as a faculty, we're trying to push that. We're trying to be out in the world and get our research and our researchers better recognised and known. Because I agree, I think in education we have the great difficulty that many of our ideas are taken and used by others and we don't do much with it ourselves, and it is difficult. I might just add as a caveat to that, when I write for the conversation, I usually get rejected. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your time. I'd like to thank Esme and Bruce and Mark particularly. <laughs> so please feel free to have a drink, catch up with these guys. Thank you very much.